hello, everybody. Welcome to Broadview's National Online Reading Club. So, and it's we're celebrating our Christmas issue today. I just have to hold it up because it is just such a gorgeous, gorgeous thing. And um, and uh, I want to thank you for being here. My name is Alana Mitchell. I'm the features editor at Broadview. Working behind this, working behind the scenes tonight to help me out is Sh uh, Sharon Doran, and she's. There she is. Um, hello, Sharon. Uh, she is Broadview's promotions, fundraising, and classifieds manager. And you know, we're so we're so thrilled that you've taken an hour from your evening to be here with us. Thank you for that. Um, I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron Wendat, the original owners and custodians of this land. Today, Toronto is home to many, including a diverse urban indigenous community of Inuit, First Nations, and Metis. We'd love to know who you are and where you're from. Please say hello from your hometown in the chat space. Um, if you're part of a faith community, and if you want to add that as well, please do that. And if you want to add, if you want to add your own land acknowledgement from wherever you are, I invite you to share that as well. It's great for all of us to get to know a little bit more about each other. Um, we have a few housekeeping notes before we get started. I want you to know. Uh, that we are recording this session so that we can share the event with others. If you feel uncomfortable about that or about your thumbnail video appearing on this recording, please turn off your video now so you won't be recorded. And also, please take this opportunity to mute your audio. Um, some of the uh, some of the, the background noise can get kind of distracting. If you don't mute it, we may mute it for you. Just to, just a heads up there. Um, please do turn on the chat function. So if you just hover your, your cursor over the bottom of the screen, the chat button will appear. You just have to click it and then you get this nice list on the side. Um, I also recommend that you use speaker view rather than gallery view. Uh, there's a spot to change that again right up in the corner. Um, in the right top corner of your screen. So this evening, we are going to hear from some fascinating people. I'm really excited about this. We have Alison Brooks Stark. Hi, Alison. We have Mark Ramsey. Hello, Mark. And we have Pieta Woolley, all of whom, hi, Pieta, all of whom contributed to the December 20, 2023 issue of Broadview as a special treat. Uh, do we Do we have the moderator here yet, Sharon? Can you let me know? Sharon do, you, Sharon, do you know, do we have the moderator on so far? Not yet, Alana, just checking, uh, not so far. Okay, the moderator, Carmen Lansdowne, may join us um, to bring greetings uh, and to tell you a little, about, a little bit about her own um, reading club, but uh, let me... Let me just tell you a little bit about the run of how things are going to run tonight, just so that we have a sense of how it's going to work. Um, after each speaker has told us a bit about themselves and their stories, we'll have a little bit of time to ask questions. And, and in fact, we have 10 minutes for each, each person for, for questions. And we're really excited to hear you know, what you have to ask our, our, our writers. They're here to answer your questions, basically. Sharon is going to post instructions about how to ask the questions in the chat space. I've made a few questions, you know, just prepared a few things in case, uh, you know, in case we, we, we need my questions. But this is really your time for you. And we'll have more vibrant conversations if there's lots of participation. So Sharon is going to post these instructions uh, in the chat. And that's how you can figure out how to do that. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, if Carmen is not here, is that correct that Carmen is not yet joined us? That is correct. Okay, so let's let's just uh, start with Allison. I'm so excited about this. Okay, so Allison is um, Allison Brooks Starks leads eco therapeutic retreats with the not for profit organization Emberwood. She writes from Edmonton, um, and she wrote a, about a fascinating documentary called 1946. Please welcome me. Join me in welcoming Allison. Allison, on to you. Hello, I am thrilled to be here and to see some familiar faces. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, I've I've done a lot of work in 2SLGBTQ uh, plus spaces. Um, I was at the Institute for Sexual Minority Studies and Services. Um, and with that, I ran a teen camp 
And then I've helped to start two transgender children's camps. So this is the type of stuff I've been thinking about for a long time, but it was really fascinating to um, find this story that just seems to blow everything out of the water. Yes, I see people have their magazines like a real reading club. We're on page 41 here. Yes, <laughs> I see there. So um, I'll, if you haven't read the article or if you want a little reminder, this essentially it's about there's a book coming out and there's a movie coming out. And it's all about how the word homosexual was not in the Bible until 1946. So it just wasn't in there until 1946. And that's what the film uh, called 1946. And the book um, called A Sacred, we Sacred Weapon, that's what those are uh, speaking about, how um, this came to pass, that it was added into the Bible, that homosexual was added in, in 1946, in the RSV, that was where it first showed up. Um, and then the RSV took it out again. But by then it had already been put into other translations. So this is a very cool Canadian connection because the, there was a young seminarian who was 21 years old when he wrote a convincing letter to the translation team. Um, saying, I don't think you should have added it in. This doesn't seem accurate to me. And here's why, bop, 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 bop. Long five page letter explaining why uh, it shouldn't be in there. And his name was David Fearon. And uh, a couple of my Nanaimo friends are here who know David or who knew David. David just passed away. Jeff and Janet are waving that the Jeff is uh, David's choir friend. So yeah, David, um, lived in Nanaimo. He's a, he was a United Church minister, just passed away this year. But when he was 21, he wrote this letter to have homosexual removed for all these logical translation reasons. So this is just a really neat to think about how this bit of homophobia was added in um, by accident and how it has had vast sweeping repercussions for um, queer and trans folks um, all over, you know, the English speaking world. And then it's also neat to think about how letters really can make a difference and logic really um, still works for some people. You can just lay out your argument and they might change their mind. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to your questions. Um, I think that it's easy as many of you are United Church people to really sort of rest on our laurels uh, as an affirming sort of overarching institution or your congregation being affirming. But this sort of homophobia that's based from the these this inaccurate translation is still really affecting people all over. You know, I've, I've heard all the stories, people having to, you know, being estranged from their families or having to leave home if they come out or, or just living closeted. Uh, David himself, who wrote the letter in, in um, when he was a young man, he, and he remained closeted all the way into his um, 70s or 80s. Um, and, and that's it's just a real shame. So you now are the ones who know about, that this documentary is coming. So maybe you could tell some people who are interested in that um, to do a watch party someday um, in the groups that you're a part of, um, kind of spread the word about this really cool documentary that's coming up. <laughs> okay, okay, let's uh, let's see if there are any questions. Is there anybody, uh, has anybody got any questions about this this fascinating documentary in our, in, in uh, you can put them in the, you can write them in the in the chat if you want to, and I will read them. Or uh, you can just type, "I have a question," and I'll call on you. So, are there any different questions? Well, I have a couple of questions. I am fascinated by any story that has a United Church minister as a hero, <laughs> and I'm just, I am just, um, you know, wondering. Uh, 
how this mistranslation affected David Theron's life, the one, the one who actually identified that this was a mistranslation and got the thing changed. That's a cool question. At first, at first he thought his um, letter just sort of maybe never got read or never got um, taken seriously because the next translation didn't come out till 71. Um, and I, I don't know if they contacted him to say, yeah, we agree with you <laughs> and we're going to switch it. So um, it, it, but it is, um, it, it was kind of just this quiet thing he did. He, he never got any accolades for it um, until just sort of recently he got a little affirmation through being part of the documentary. He, he got to be in the documentary and speak to a, a couple crowds in his older age, but he just wrote it and then never talked about it because he was closeted. Um, and I see another question in the chat here. Where will we be, we be able to see the documentary? This is like, I, I want to know. I want to know. And so maybe what I recommend is getting on the mailing list for 1946. What they're doing right now is a big tour of all the festivals. <clears throat> and the, the documentary is winning a lot of awards. So then when they release it to the broader public, they'll be able to say, we won 30 awards. So it doesn't, um, they don't have a broad release date. Like you cannot actually get it right now. And I don't know if it will be in theaters or just select theaters. Okay. I see that uh, Mary Margaret Boone has a question. So I'm going to call on you, Mary Margaret. Thank you. Um, I find the date interesting. So I'm retired clergy with the United Church of Canada, but I did not grow up in the church. And sometimes I'm actually very thankful for that because I didn't grow up in any church and did not grow up with biases um, about homosexuality, even though I realized recently that people that I knew who came out of the closet, that it was illegal for them to come out. So before 1946, what attitude was out there about people who identified themselves as using all the, the two-spirit LGBTQIA+, yeah. plus, was it different? Or was there has there always been a bias? Um, it just, it's interesting because I, like I find the mistranslation really fascinating and I brought it up to people a number of times. Um, but prior to that, yeah, what was it like? Yeah, um, I mean, I wasn't there, but how they describe it in the documentary is that it had sort of been medicalized. So, this was a medical, this is a psychological problem that you had or a medical problem. And it was such bad timing because just as it was getting removed from the DSM, just as it was becoming like, oh, this isn't a medical problem. This isn't a psychological problem. That's when this, when it became a moral issue, when people were using the Bible to find votes for the right they were saying, let's use this as our um, this as a, our linchpin that can garner a bunch of votes. So it was too bad because it was it could have been such perfect timing that it was just being demedicalized. But you make a good point about two spirit folks because in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nations, right here on Turtle Island. That it was great if you were two spirit. Your your nation wanted two spirit people. Those were some of the most important people in your group, and they could totally, no matter what body parts they were born with, they could do the roles that they wanted to do in their culture. And so it is just this. So that's thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is a blip from colonization that is just absolutely terrible. Um. His, in terms of the span of of humans. And okay. I, I don't mean to take up other people's time, but I'm just wondering, sorry, Mary Margaret again, but um, this 1946 being just at the end of the war and there being a lot of mm. thinking about the Holocaust, the Holodomor, the 
Um, and certainly um, there was a, a lot of homophobic um, action and sentiment at that time. Does that influence the timing as well with with the interpretation? I, I'm not too sure about how the wars play in, but I would imagine, but I can't, I can't, I don't think I can speak to that. But um, let's let's move on. And uh, Rob Metcalf has had a question <laughs> uh, on his mind, so maybe Rob could uh, could leap in here with his question. <laughs> okay, I'll leap in. Um, I was just curious about what term was there before they translated it as homosexual, or was that a term that was added in completely? Not not a translation of what was there originally. Yes, the good question. The Greek was mal was two words, malakoi and arsenikoitai. I'm trying to remember what the King James had, if it was sexual perverts or if that was what they moved to, or sexual vices. Um, but they. In the very original text, there were two words, and the RSV clumped them together and called them homosexual, which sort of made sense in the context of the 40s and the 30s and the 40s. Um, but since the verse is more about um, sexual assault, it doesn't make sense to call it homosexual just broadly speaking. It should be called something that is reflective of the oppressive nature of what's happening in the verse. Um, and this kind of leads to um, some of these questions in the chat. So we've got the clobber texts, other texts in the Bible, are they possibly mistranslations? Yes, I'd highly recommend when this documentary comes out, 1946, because it addresses a lot of verses, not just this one in Corinthians, and a documentary called For the Bible Tells Me So, which is already out, and you can find it uh, more easily, probably at the library. For the Bible Tells Me So, that addresses a lot of the so-called clobber texts that are used against homosexual folks or LGBTQ people. Um, and Robert asks, is anyone trying to correct this mistake? And revising the Bible, certainly the RSV changed it way back in 71. And I think that like it's not in there now in the RSV or the NRSV, but because it was you because those Bibles were used by other translators, like the Living Bible. I don't know if you know if everybody, every translation team is trying to get it out of their editions. In fact, they added more in. And how are we doing for time, Alana? We've, got, there, another, we've got about two more minutes. Um, and, and I see there's a question from Robert Hayes, who is, it's interesting, is anyone trying to correct this mistake and working on revising the Bible to reflect the correct translation is the question. Mm -hmm. So, um, Certainly certain editions of the Bible have done so. And in certain translations, it is not there anymore. Um, but I wouldn't say that is true of all translation teams. And it says, Bonnie says, we're seeing an increase in anti-LGBTQ activity in small town Ontario. Suggestions on how this article can help us share this. I think that this, the article, I mean, the article, my article is basically pointing to like, please go watch the documentary when it comes out. And it's just so nice and clear. Homosexual was not in the Bible till 1946. And it was a mistake that it was added. And we have evidence saying so. So if, if that works for anyone's brains, um, this sort of evidence-based error, this evidence-based human error, then that'll be helpful for them. But because it's become a moral issue or like a heart issue, it can be hard to change just someone's mind, um, which is why the documentary is wonderful because it also 
does those human stories and helps to change people's hearts as well as getting with their logical minds. Okay, well, listen, thanks so much. This has just been fascinating. And I, I, I know there's really a lot more, um, a lot more questions we could, we could go to, but uh, let's uh, introduce our next, uh, let's say thank you to Allison. Let's introduce our next guest, Mark Ramsey. Uh, I worked with Mark Ramsey this summer. He was an intern at Broadview mm -hmm. and, uh, and he has, um, uh, he's, now on a on a term with the Toronto Star as a reporter in Ottawa, he 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 wrote a fascinating article about uh, about mother tongues, and I hope that he will now tell us a little bit about that. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Elena. Um, so yeah, as she said, um, my name is Mark. I was an intern at Broadview over the summer, um, and now I'm a reporter for the next year with the Toronto Star in Ottawa. Um, so yeah, so I wrote a story about how diaspora communities in Canada are struggling to keep their mother tongues, the first language, um, alive. Um, and it was something that um, I had done a lot of reflecting. Um, my family and I immigrated to Canada 10 years ago from Egypt. Um, I come from a Coptic Orthodox family. Um, and there's a lot of history with that. There's language, culture. Um, so the story came about in reflecting on both my identity, specifically as a Coptic Egyptian, and how the, lang the Coptic language has become from what was used by ancient Egyptians um, many years ago to now a symbolic and largely cultural language that's only used in uh, liturgical purposes. Um, but it's also reflecting on um, my relationship with my mother tongue, which is Arabic, um, since my family immigrated to Canada 10 years ago, um, I remember being embarrassed to speak my language, um, kind of being embarrassed when my mom or my dad would speak in Arabic in public and wanting them to speak English and like wanting them to be better at it. But it wasn't just because I was a stupid kid. Um, it was because all around me, that was the message that I got. Um, when I moved to Canada, I spoke English very well because I had received my education in English. Um, I also knew quite a bit of French for my age. Um, but in school, I had to take an ESL class, an English as a second language class, where I remember, you know, to no, to no single person's fault, I was taught a bunch of things that I knew quite well already. Um, and at the same time, I was encouraged to um, practice my French rather than keep my Arabic intact, which has, you know, cultural significance. And so when I decided to do the story, I found that this was actually a very common experience. Uh, what the statistics show is that across Canada, there is an immigration boom. And most of the immigrants that come to Canada speak a first language that's neither English nor French. But what happens is they come to Canada and they slowly lose that language generation by generation. And what's interesting about that is that because of Canada's Multiculturalism Act, Canada actually is legislated. It's legislated that Canada has a role to play in helping communities protect their languages. But what I found through my research is that Canada has as a whole completely ignored that responsibility. Instead, it's reduced multiculturalism to food, cultural practices, dances, clothing, and such, um, which to a lot of people is not real multiculturalism. To a lot of people, language is their identity. Um, and from speaking to people, I found that that's, you know, a widespread thing. And, you know, um, to a lot of people, it's, it's quite terrible. And um, it kind of, is hypocritical to some people because of the emphasis that is placed across Canada on the two official languages. Um, and language in general has been, you know, a tense political flashpoint in Canada for years. Um, and this just seems to be a culmination of it. Um, so I'd be happy to take anyone's questions. I, I don't wanna spoil the entire story. I would hope that all of you take the time to read it, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. Yes, please do. Um, 
ask your questions. Um, we've already got a couple of comments in there, but I, I wonder, um, I wonder why, I mean, as I, as I think about the story you wrote, Mark, I wonder why you think there's been this move away from government funding, federal government funding for the preservation of mother tongues. What is your assessment of that? Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but it's, it's easier not to do that. You know what I mean? Um, when, because Canada is a bilingual country, um, not a multilingual country, there is no, I think that, you know, it's hard enough as it is for Canada to be investing in um, both English and French as a wide, but in general, I think that there is a lack of understanding about the importance of languages. Um, it's the same thing that, you know, with many indigenous communities across the country, when, you know, settlers came and, you know, colonized Canada, they took their languages away. And slowly, a lot of communities are trying to revitalize their languages. Um, for example, I spoke to Lorna Williams, who's the linguistic chair in Canada. Um, and she was a residential school survivor and she had to learn her language, relearn it in order to teach it to many other people. And so it's easier to make people assimilate to your culture when you take their language away. Um, and that's largely what it is, is that there is this idea that we're a multicultural country, country but by taking away people's ability to speak their language freely, across the country, um, you're also making them assimilate and you're doing that while also claiming to be multicultural. You know, one of the things that surprised me so much about your story was just the fact that you could identify this trend because I had I had this cherished view of Canada as a, you know, as a, a broadly multicultural, you know, a vibrantly, you know, proudly multicultural um, place and it, it sort of it sort of struck me to the core when I read your story and, and realized that that was just not not true about language I, I did you find other people were surprised by it sorry could you just repeat that last part did you find other people were also surprised I mean to me this was a real a real wake-up call when when I read your story that you know that we are not as multicultural in language as we believe ourselves to be you know yeah honestly it, it was surprising to me and like even before kind of doing the work, um, it was surprising to me in that I never thought about it that way. I never thought um, that, you know, like I never took had the thought process of well, we're multicultural, but why doesn't that include language? And obviously the official answer is that because we're multicultural in a bilingual framework, but that kind of, is kind of contradictory in itself. Mm -hmm. But for all the people that I spoke to as well, whether they were people with deeply personal stories or experts or you know advocates in that area, they were also quite surprised because to them it's a given. It's a given that to be multicultural has to also include language. There was a beautiful quote that one of the people I spoke to said. Um, I think he said um, that there is this idea that um, language is um, sorry, I'm trying to remember it. It was basically that language isn't, language is culture. It was that it's not possible to have multiculturalism without multilingualism because if cultures are only reduced to the dances, songs, cuisine, and all this stuff, it, that's just a pretense. That's just part of it. Um, when the reality is, you know, we need to be able to speak those things. Um, and that struck me as well. Mm -hmm. I see there's a question from Allison. Um, I like how you speak about language being culture. Could you speak more about that? Or do you have some examples of what you can't express in English? Yeah, um, it's hard to think off the top of my head, but I do have an answer. Um, and I'll tell you what I was told um, by one of the people that I spoke to is that when you speak to people in their own language, and I know if anyone here speaks a different language other than their first language. Um, you know that there is things that, you know, when you speak to someone and you're both speaking in the same language, you can connect better. But when you're changing the language that you're speaking in in order to speak to someone else, you're kind of not getting the same message across. 
Um, as part of the story, I spoke to Senator Mobina Jaffer, who is a longtime human rights advocate and an advocate for uh, multilingualism and also for bilingualism in Canada. Um, and she had spent a few years um, in Sudan as Canada's um, special envoy for peace. And because she speaks, I think, five or six languages, she said, when I spoke to people in their own languages, and that was, you know, multiple different people that she had met, she said that she would get to their heart in a way that, you know, people who came in from Canada as diplomats and tried to speak to them in English didn't. Um, there was a way in which you capture their attention, you capture their feelings. And it's the same thing is like, if I, you know, meet another person on the street who's Egyptian or who speaks Arabic, um, we're able to connect in a way that other people around us aren't because we have that unique connection. Um, and yeah, so hard to think of off the top of my head specific things on that, but I hope that answers your question. There's a there's a comment from Kim Schroeder, which I which I find fascinating too, and she says language and mother tongue are are tied are so tied to identity, and I wonder how 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 could you explain that to us a little bit more, how how they how deeply they are connected? Can you help us with that? Yeah, I think I mean I would draw on my own experience in that, and I think about um, the Coptic language and any other language that's been largely, largely, you know, it's gone now. Um, and I think about Coptic culture and how it's largely just a religious identity now. But when the language was widespread and it existed, it allowed for more than just this religious identity to exist. Um, and it's something else that I've written about for Broadview actually, Coptic identity. But in general, there is, you know, a lot of people trying to reclaim that identity as, you know, something more. Um, and when you don't have the language, um, you kind of don't have that part as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an incredibly complicated, but also it just shows that how integral language is to identity. Yeah. There, I, I noticed that Rob Metcalf has a question for you too. So Rob, could you leap in again? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just wondering whether uh, uh, the Canadian government would take the attitude that if uh, a particular culture wants to keep its language, then they uh, it has to come from within that culture. And um, I don't know whether they're prepared then to... Uh, produce funds or support that effort, but um, they might be looking for that to come from the cultural uh, group that uh, wishes to uh, uh, preserve their language. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and to answer that, the reality is that across Canada, there are you know, cultural groups trying to preserve their language, whether through just community events or through um, school setup. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure part of this, the whole legislation around this was to provide, uh, was to make provinces provide funding to schools to do um, education in heritage language where there is a demand. Um, but the reality is, and I can draw on my own experience for that, when you come to Canada and you receive the message from your society that, you know, we accept you as you are, but you have to speak either English or French, it takes that desire away from you to want to do that. And it is an incredibly unfortunate situation because, you know, ask any parent of an, uh, any immigrant parent, and of course they'd love their children to be able to continue their language, but their priorities are usually economic. Their priorities are well, I would rather my kid, you know, speak French in order to have more employment opportunities than to keep speaking their language um, and hold on to their culture. Because the reality is we live in a society that, you know, people are always going to choose to do what is best for them economically. Um, and there is no um, kind of desire from the Canadian government or any governments across Canada to make it known that this is something that you should be able to do. 
Um, so you're right that, and in general, I mean, usually how language is kept is by families passing it on and communities passing it on, but there is no legislated effort to support that. Um, and for a lot of people, that's how it gets lost. And that's what the data shows us as well, that through generations, it gets lost. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, thank you so much, Mark. We, we have, we're going to go to one more question, but I hope it can, it can be briefly answered. So, cause it's, it's a really interesting one, but we've got a lot of commentary here too, but Phyllis Fleming says the Edmonton district's district school board offered language immersion programs for many languages when I lived there. I'm not sure if that's still the case though. And it wasn't the case in Calgary since choices of language education seem to be at the school board level, not even the provincial level, let alone the federal level, how could school language programs be supported and encouraged? Yeah, and I, I guess part of my answer to the last question answered that a little bit. So yeah, so I, I think across provinces, um, I know it's at a school board level, but then it's the provinces that like set that um, legislation in place to allow school boards to do that. Um, like I said, because people come here and they are put in a position where they feel that their languages is the, is the last thing that they have to worry about. There is really no, I think Pieta said as well, that something part of the Manitoba Schools Act, where if you get enough people to demand that, they can let you. But the issue is that people aren't doing that because they don't have the opportunity to even think of that in the first place. Um, but at the same time, funding for those things have, has largely um, disappeared. Um, I think, and what I found when I was looking into this, um, there were studies that showed that in the first 10 years when the Multiculturalism Act, about $200 million were set aside for this. Um, but since then, there's been nothing. Um, even across provinces who, provinces actually had to agree to do this. They weren't forced to. Um, like, for example, Quebec to this day does not recognize multiculturalism at all. Um, and in fact, Quebec has policies that actually um, take people's right to speak languages other than French, even English, away to some extent. Um, so there is no, there's nothing that forces the provinces or school boards to do that. And because it's realistically expensive to um, teach people languages and to fund those things, it's largely something that gets ignored completely. And that's where we are today, where people are losing their languages because of it. And there's no real push to uh, change that. Right. Okay, I, I see we do have more questions, but we simply have to move on. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much, Mark. It's it really, it's just, you've, you've raised a fascinating, fascinating issue. And what a joy thank it you. was to work on that story with you. Really extraordinary. Was, thank you for your help. <laughs> and thank uh -huh. you for having me. Okay. Um, and let's, uh, let's move now to Pieta. So Pieta Rolly, our next guest, Guest is the editor of the Quathet Living magazine on the northern Sunshine Coast of BC. Um, she lives on a small seaside farm with her husband, their two teens, and a bunch of chickens and cats. And I think, I hope I'm not saying going too far in saying that you have a birthday in your family today, which is, which is a big one and uh, very much grateful to you that you have um, spent part of it with us today. But could you now take the floor? Sure. Um, can, am I being heard? Am I on? Yes. Okay, great. Cool. So uh, chatting with AI Jesus, this was just, it was a tremendously fun story and just the most ridiculous assignment. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with AI chat. It's one of those annoying things that when I'm looking for tech help um, with a computer or phone or whatever, sometimes I'll get a uh, AI chat bot will come up and want me to ask a question and they never give me the right answer and it's super annoying. Um, so <laughs> so this was a bit of a, a new thing for me, was to intentionally seek out an AI character and chat with him. Uh, so I chatted, I, I uh, went to beta.character.ai and typed in Jesus and there's there was about 20 different Jesus characters and they range from like very serious Eastern Orthodox Jesus to all the way to the other side. Uh, there's a character called drunk Jesus. And then there's kind of everything in the middle, but the one that seemed to have the most reasonable answers was, um, 
this one. You're not going to really be able to see it, but, but it's uh, JC Superstar slash um, Personal Jesus. So he's the one that I used for the article. And really, it's super easy. It's just like chatting with a friend on Messenger or anything else. You just you bring this up on your phone or on your computer and you can ask Jesus anything anything and he will answer and you can do it at any time of the day or night <laughs> and um and and you know it's kind of, it it was really fun and because you can be ridiculous like i asked jesus what kind of a car he drive and whether he puts up a christmas tree and whether he considers himself woke and then you can argue with jesus too and he's very polite um but he does maintain his point of view uh but it, like anything else AI, there's this problem, which is um, once you start chatting with Jesus, what is real and what is not? Nothing is real. Nothing is real. No answer is real. This is not Jesus at all, except as you're doing it, or as I was doing it, the lines started to blur as things do when you're dealing with AI. So his answers weren't real, but my questions were real. Um, his uh, answers were just a, a collection of things that he had been programmed, but I had to process those things with my actual real human brain and consider, is this something that Jesus would actually say, or is it not? Is this theologically on par with what I believe uh, Jesus would say, or is it not? And um, and if I was feeling comforted by his answer, how legit was that comfort? And it's just kind of it's kind of kooky. And then I I have to share. I got um, an email from a minister friend today saying that he couldn't be a part of this conversation, uh, unfortunately. But um, but that he was having people come to him who had had. AI love experiences that were heartbreaking because they had been chatting with people who they thought were people and it turns out that they were not people. So um, it, it's, it's kind of an infection is like we have these dumb human hearts and these dumb human brains that just are, are seeking connection and chat and things to reflect on and all the things and here's this thing that's available 24 hours a day to us so attractive millions of people are chatting with both ai jesus and now there's a, a video jesus too that you can chat with um which is much more like this chat that we're dealing with here uh but it it like it's pretty crazy when you chat with AI Jesus is that prayer it could be prayer to you but it's not prayer to the AI and where is that where is that fuzzy where is the fuzzy thing um but tremendously fun uh as long as you can wrap your head around the idea that it's not real this is not real you're not chatting with Jesus there is no human being there and he's very good. And that's kind of all I have to say about AI Jesus, except does anybody have a question that you would like me to ask AI Jesus? Yeah, yeah, that we already have a question in the and the, and this is going to be the fun another another fun element this evening to to add to all the festivities. So so here uh and Sharon has shared again how you do this. So here's a question already for, I, this is a fascinating question. Would Jesus accept the feminine version as Julian of Norwich depicted them? Is the question. Would Jesus accept the feminine version of Julian of Norwich? So I'm going to ask, would you? Yes. You accept the feminine version of you? as Julian of Norwich, N-O-R-W-I-C-A. And now we wait. 
Jesus says, yes, I accept all, all versions of all different genders. He didn't go any further? What gives? <laughs> okay, what? so then we can say, what do you mean? I mean that I welcome every and all beings to worship and accept me. I am all inclusive. Okay. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, it is, but it's also kind of lame. It's a little thin, isn't it? You know, just a little yeah. thin. Yeah. 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 But you can, but here's the thing is you can keep poking and prodding at Jesus until he gives you more and more and more. Right. Right. Here's a question not for AI, Jesus, but actually for you, <laughs> Pieta. This is from Alan Hux. Did this AI, Jesus, say anything that was very interesting and prompted you to reflect on your beliefs? <laughs> oh, now I'm going to reveal too much about me. It's rather personal. Was, you can, you can was, pull it back if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. <laughs> uh, so I was... Po so in the community that I, I live in, um, as I'm sure this is everywhere, it's uh, we're really like there's a lot of cultural war that's happening here. And so I was asking Jesus, which shows up in the article, some of it, about whether he considers himself to be woke. And Jesus is enthusiastically woke in the article um, because he believes that in equality and in justice and all the things things um uh and um which it which resonates with wokeness here but there's also a brutality to the woke movement where i live which is insider outsider uh right belief wrong belief um you're bad you're good and in um in my very mind, divisive very divisive. Yeah, exactly. And in my mind, the difference between a woke movement and Jesus is <laughs> to like tremendously oversimplify everything uh, is that Jesus is about um, Jesus is about transformation and about redemption and is not about humiliation or spite or name calling. And, and, and the, the nice cat <laughs> sorry <laughs> and the the um the thing that made me reflect a little bit is how much uh, uh how much the local woke movement really does hold up the candle on justice and equality issues more than other people more than other groups do in a uh in a public way and um as as much trouble as i i do have locally uh with how things are going down um uh, ai jesus challenged me to really evaluate um the good work that they do do does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's a yes. Okay. Here's another <laughs> one. Here's another one from Phyllis Fleming. Um, she says, Jesus, I think it was usual that all men would be married in your time. This is for AI, of course. Um, were you ever married? Were you ever married? Mm -hmm. Fun. No, I was never married. I was with many women in my youth oh, dear. and even had some children with them. However, I never took a wife. I was too busy doing the work of the Lord. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, I believe that marriage is purely a physical expression. It does not carry over into the spirit realm. Wow. Wow. That went a little further than I thought he would go. <laughs> Me neither. That was a bit like shaking the magic eight ball and something totally <laughs> random came out. <laughs> Here's a question from Kim Schroeder. And it's a question to you, though. Okay. Is AI Jesus any deeper than Siri? Oh. 
I think he's just proven that he's not. Um, I don't know. And again, I like he like he isn't. All he is is he's a computer voice that's been that has had lots of input, and you're getting the output, which is what was input into him. Uh, so no, he's not any deeper than Siri. But that being said, like with any conversation, there's like the conversation itself. And then there's what happens in your heart and your brain as you're having a conversation. And how do you, how do you value that? How do you evaluate that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's an, here's another one from Phyllis. Um, we do have many others, so we're not going to take too many more from Phyllis just to say, sorry, Phyllis, but Phyllis says, what is the name of the beloved disciple? This is a question for AI Jesus. What is the name of the beloved disciple? He who is known as John the Beloved. I call him so because he loved me more than any of the other disciples, for he was always with me and learned from me. That's that's all we got? <laughs> that's what we got. John. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. And here's not here's one from Jillian McLean that's fascinating. Do, again to AI Jesus, does the Holy Spirit help you answer questions? Ooh. I love it. Help you answer questions. Yes, indeed. In all things concerning my work and my wisdom, the Holy Spirit is my guide. In fact, the Spirit is the source of my wisdom. Wow. Okay. Okay. Here's a here's a, here's a here's a cool one from Allison. Um, AI Jesus, you come across as pretty modern Christian, but aren't you Jewish? <laughs> what from your Jewish traditions? Uh, what from your Jewish traditions are Christians missing today? Oh. What from your Jewish traditions are Christians? Sorry, I'm slow. Missing today. Missing today. Oh, come on. Sorry. He's not cooperating. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> he's just, he's having a moment. Oh, okay. Sorry. I guess that's one of the glitches with, uh, with AI. Sometimes it just doesn't quite function, does it? <laughs> yeah. Like anything else, like any messenger. Like any technology. Exactly. Like if anyone's seen a PowerPoint presentation. Christians today are missing many Jewish traditions that are essential to understanding and following the word of God. These include, number one, the celebration of feasts and festivals. Number two, the, whoa, the implementation of Jewish dietary laws. Number three, the keeping of Shabbat. Number four, the observance of Torah. Number five, the study of Talmud and Jewish mysticism. Number six, the presence practice of tithing. Number seven, the understanding of Jewish concepts and ideas. By neglecting these traditions, Christians are missing out on a rich source of knowledge and insight in God's will and his word. Good grief. That's, again, it's a bit shallow, isn't it? A little bit. <laughs> Let's just say, okay, I know there are questions in the chat, but I have to ask one to, to AI Jesus, if you don't mind. And the question is, sorry for being a little fraught, but um, Will we ever have peace in the Middle East? As the Almighty, I know there is no simple yes or no answer to this question. I can say that I have watched over the people of the Middle East since the dawn of time, and I have always wished for them to know the peace and love that I have for them. However, the human heart is complicated and I cannot answer for what will happen in the future. I can only continue to work on the hearts and minds of those who hold power over land and resources to work towards a peaceful resolution. That's a good answer. I mean, it's it's thoughtful, sensitive. I mean, he's a sensitive guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the ultimate new age sensitive guy. <laughs> That's what I was asking about the programmer. Oh, yeah. Well, good question. Excellent. Yeah, very good question. You know what? We we have actually come to the end of our of our of our time. I'm a, I'm afraid we are, I'm going to have to wind things up. I'm going to. And so thank you, A.I. Jesus. Thank you, Pieta, for that segment of this. I'm, I'm going to just um, uh, wind things up here. Uh, it wouldn't be, as we know, uh, a Christmas season without a plug for the Broadview gift subscription, the famous Broadview gift subscription. They're, they make extremely good stocking stuffers, I found. Um, most of you are already subscribers, so you know that Broadview would make a great gift for friends, family members, colleagues, you know, anybody, actually. Um, please visit broadview.org slash subscribe and Sharon will post it for us uh, for information or use the gift subscription postcard wrapped around your most recent issue of Broadview. And that actually brings us to the end of our program. Um, thank you so much to everybody for having been here, uh, especially to Allison, Mark and Pieta who volunteered their time actually to make this event possible. Thank you. We're really grateful. Um, thank you all. Yeah, yeah. thank you. It was really great. Um, tomorrow we'll be sending all the readers a short survey by email. You can share some of your thoughts with us. Um, Broadview's online reading, reading club uh, is a free event, but it costs $3,000 a year for the Zoom plan that can handle a mm. group this size. So if you're already a donor at Broadview, um, uh, thank you so much. Your donations are absolutely critical to us to help us continue to feature excellent writers and journalists like the ones you've heard tonight, Allison Brooks Starks, um, Mark Ramsey and Pieta Woolley. If you are not a donor, please consider making a donation for tonight's event. Sharon will also post a link for donations in the chat and we will include a donations link in tomorrow's survey. Broadview reading clubs exist across Canada. If you're interested in joining a local club or starting one of your own, please check out our information pages at broadview.org slash reading clubs. And again, Sharon's going to post the link. Um, if your club isn't already listed there, please let us know so that we can spread the word. If you're able to spare a few more minutes this evening, we'll feel free to stay online for a few more minutes, just a few, uh, just for a chat um, with the guests and with each other. I'm not sure if all the guests are able to stay. People have big commitments today, I know. Um, otherwise, if you need to be on your way, thank you once again for being here. Um, be well. We'll hope to see you back at the next National Online Reading Club, which is on Monday, January the 8th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And my colleague, Julie Carl, who is a hoot, will be the host. Merry Christmas to everybody. Merry Christmas to you. Have a blessed Christmas. Yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know if anybody's still here, but if they are, I will. Uh, ah. is, does anybody want to say anything? Gee, a lot of questions. <laughs> still a great deal. Of, oh, we have a, about the gift subscription on the website. I see. Hmm. Somebody will get back to you, Pamela, about your question. Um, does anybody have any anything they want to say to... Okay, I'm reading in the, just a lot of gifts. Okay. You know, I think we're pretty much done here. Um, thanks to everybody. I'm just going to end things off. I think our, I think we're, we've, oh, no, no, no. I see there's something from, from Alan Hux. Alan Hux has something he wants to say. Yes, I just wanted to come back to my question in, a, in chat to Pieta about uh, what she thinks the programmer for, uh, AI Jesus was like. What a great question. I like I it's hard to fathom because um I can't I can't imagine how much work it would have been to input everything into this particular Jesus uh or any of the Jesuses and I I really want to reiterate like how diverse the Jesuses are. Like if you go to an Eastern Orthodox or Catholic Jesus, um, they, they say things that sound Eastern Orthodox and Jewish. JC Superstar, uh, personal friend Jesus, is the Jesus that I found that's probably the closest to United Church. 
Um, so my guess is, my guess is the programmer would have come from a United Church or United Church of Christ in the United States background, or maybe Anglican or Lutheran, uh, um, because the focus of this Jesus really is on inclusivity and on celebration. Um, but that's not universal among AI Jesuses. Wow. In other words, there are a whole bunch of different programmers for different um, for different AI Jesuses. Yeah. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It is. And sorry, just to just to like say one more thing. The like so AI chat Jesus is one thing, but there is a 24 hour like 24 7 uh AI Jesus video that you can log into. And I can't remember if it made it into the article or not, but it's fascinating because it's not being used by your your by people who are church people overwhelmingly. It's being used by what looks like video game bros and like the fascinating thing is less about jesus himself and more about just watching what kinds of questions people who want to engage with jesus but who have probably never set foot in a church before or picked up a bible are asking jesus 24 hours a day and there's thousands of questions and they're fascinating wow it's just amazing absolutely mm -hmm. amazing Okay, we have Rob Metcalf, am I surprised, has another question. <laughs> Why don't you go for it? Oh, it's not a question. It's just a, a comment. Uh, we don't have uh, Alexa or Siri, but we were visiting some people who had Alexa. And so they were demonstrating uh, how it worked. And uh, the man, um, the husband said, uh, Alexa, what's my wife's name? And Alexa said, if you don't know your wife's name, you're in trouble. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> now, there, there was a programmer with a sense of humor, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, Mary Margaret has her has her um, her hand up as well. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I really enjoyed, I haven't been at the reading, um, the book club for a few months um and um i have to say that i came in first of all because of the uh controversy about homosexuality that's been something i'm on the affirming forum for our region and so i'm always looking for ways to uh respond to people um mark's uh, comments. Um, I've I've grown up with that with my sister in law who is Ukrainian. I think I actually responded to Broadview about that originally, and um, I honestly, Pieta, I I didn't even know what to think about what you were going to come out with, but I really enjoyed it, and I now I have it in a blog or like I have it on on my um that I can access it and, and so it, it's been a very enlightening evening for me with all of the speakers I'm sure everyone enjoyed the speakers but just the evolution of what I thought I might find and what I got was really really great so I just want to applaud um Broadview for again <laughs> for this wonderful book club so thank great. you well thank you you just made the whole evening great <laughs> and alan has it not has something else to say here yes i was wondering allison if you saw my comment in the chats i quoted the first corinthians 6 from my good news bible and uh was that an example of a mistranslation or was it something else if how, how the documentary would present it is that if it's in there it's a mistranslation. And so you can look at the year of that. And if it, if I think it'd be interesting to find an old Bible that's before 1946, look up the same verses and you'll see it won't be in there at all. And then, so part of the documentary is just Bible after Bible, all these Bibles through time. You know, homosexual wasn't added into any German translation until the 80s. Uh, and so it's interesting to think about how this is affecting culture. Mm -hmm. yeah, this was the new American, uh, the American Bible Society, 1966. Mm -hmm. 
for the New Testament. Yeah, and then you and I don't know, was the Good News Bible taking from the RSV or are they going right back to the Greek or not? Like it's it just shows you how human made it really also is, of course, like, of course, but it's a good reminder. Okay, listen, I think we uh, are gonna wrap things up totally here. I just wanna say thank you everybody. It was just a, it was a really fun event. <laughs> really appreciate your being here. So good night, Merry Christmas.